live? Good. Can you hear me? Oh, well, who knows until we get to the editing room, right? <laughs> um, so for those who are watching this on your computer, they have canceled class today. So I'm taking the time to record my lecture in a different room and posting it online. Um, you guys might be watching this on YouTube or um, just downloading the file. Uh, before I get into the lecture, let's talk a little bit about the exam. Um, the exam is still scheduled for Monday. And it has not been changed. Unless, of course, they cancel a class on Monday, then we'll figure it out from there. Um, I still plan on holding a review class on Friday where I will go over the sections that will be on the exam. The material that we'll, you guys are going to be testing on for midterm, midterm number two is going to be uh, gases and electrons. So we're not, there were, anything that I talk about today, minus electron configurations, is not going to be on the exam. So we're, there's going to be no periodic law questions, no atomic size questions. Uh, electronegativity, that stuff isn't going to be on the exam at all. So it's just strictly electrons and gases and all the subsections here in for that. So last class, I stopped right after talking about electron configurations, and I was going to start talking about exceptions. So unfortunately, the electron configurations don't do so well for some of our transition metals. I'm looking for a periodic table in here. Uh, there's a periodic table. On the other side of the room. Go ahead um, turn. Yeah, go ahead and turn it around, Dan. Dan is our cameraman for today. Yeah, just, just swing the whole thing around. So the transition metals, that is the block from columns 3 to 12, there are some exceptions to the rules that we're going to talk about right now. Uh, Dan, you can turn it around. I would suggest printing out a periodic table as you're watching this or having one up on your screen. So when filling electrons for d orbitals, for elements in the fourth, which is chromium and below, and ninth, copper and below, you go against the out bound principle. So if I were to draw a, let's draw the energy orbital diagram for what we believe this thing would look like. So I'm going to draw 4s. six electrons to fill into this orbital, and using the principles we learned, we would go one, two, three, four, five, six. So this is what we expect the, or the configuration for, this is for chromium, which is a normal gas configuration, argon, 4s2, 3d4. If you look at this diagram, though, we have the energy of our 4s orbital is slightly higher than the energy of our 3d orbital. So what ends up really happening is this electron that is spin down here decides, well, the energy over here in this open orbital is lower than it is up here. And I like being in a low energy state. So instead, what's going to happen is this electron, oh, it doesn't want to erase itself. Let's use a different slide then. We're going to redraw this and we'll actually see it. We'll see that. There are 4s again. 5, 3. Instead of having two electrons in this 4s orbital, one of them is going to be demoted down to this 3 orbital, 3d orbital. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Six. So our electron configuration becomes argon, this is noble gas, 4s1, because we only have one electron in this 4s orbital, 3d5. And the reason this is happening is because the, the pairing energy of having these two electrons in the same orbital is higher than if we put this electron out here. And copper and the elements below copper exhibit the same principle. That is one of our first exceptions. I guess we can, since we have infinite amount of time, let's do copper also. 
because class can technically be as long as I want this video to be. I'm not going to make it really long. That's just not cool. So we're going to do copper right now. Copper has an electron configuration of argon. We're going to do the what's expected first. 4s2, 3d9. So here's our 4s orbital. So we have one, two, three, four, six. So what's happening here is I'm going to switch colors off to redraw this thing. This electron that's spin down decides there's one free space for me down here that is lower in energy. So I'm just going to move over here. Thus, making our configuration not this, but 4s1, 3d, 10. This filled shell acts like a noble gas configuration, and elements want to be in a noble gas configuration because it's really stable. So the stability of having the electron being demoted from here to here is better in energy than keeping it in the forest. All right. Need to remember not to move too fast because we still have to move so that's slow. Additionally, for transition metal cations, you remove electrons from the s orbital before removing from the d orbital. So as you saw before, the s orbital was higher in energy than the d orbital. So if I were to write the configuration, let's do an example really quick of, let's do vanadium. So vanadium's electron, electron configuration is, again, argon. 4s2, 3d3. If I were to make, if I were to oxidize this atom, so I'm going from vanadium to vanadium plus, you would, some people would think, well, I'm going to remove from this orbital first, but in actuality, because this orbital is higher in energy, it's easier to remove. So the configuration for uh, transition metal cations would be to always remove from the s orbital first. So our configuration for our cation becomes 4s1, 3d3. I can remove another electron, let's do vanadium 2 plus. Vanadium 2 plus would remove the electron completely from the 4s1 orbital. So now we don't have any electrons in the s orbital. So we're left with 3d3. And if I wanted to continue to remove electrons, now I can only remove from the d orbital. Three d2. And let's go, let's go all the way to vanadium 5 plus. 3d1. And finally, vanadium 5 plus. This just becomes the noble gas before the metal. So this would be a completely oxidized element for uh, atom for vanadium. Okay, and that covers most of, I think this covers like pretty much everything that's going to be on the exam. So the, the reason why this happens, why the transition metals act the way they act, you know the really nice thing about recording like this is that if I go too fast, you can just like go back in the video, and just rewatch it. It's kind of nice. I don't know why. So why is it that these uh, the transition metals like to do this? So half-filled shells are stable. Because you have no electron electron repulsions. This repulsion energy is pretty high, so elements, atoms like to spread out their electrons evenly among their orbitals so that we will have these repulsions happen. 
And then finally, filled shells act like a noble gas. So whenever you have an atom that fills up its p orbitals, fills up its d orbitals, it's going to have some noble gas character. It's going to be stable. So it looks like that. All right. So that concludes the rest of the material that we're going to go over on Friday. The material you're about to see from now on will not be on the. Oh wait, no, we still have lanthanides and actinides on line. Giant wire. Dan, how could you let me laugh? I'm sorry. So let's talk about lanthanides. Actinides. Zoom in a little bit. All right, electron configuration, lanthanides and actinides. For the purposes of electron configuration, lanthanum and actinide might want to. Ah, oh, nice. Sweet. Thanks, man. So we look at the periodic table, oh man, this, this is great. Uh, lanthanum and actinum uh, start the lanthanide series and the actinide series. Some periodic, periodic tables like to put lanthanum and act, actinium up here with the D block. And some of them like to put them down here like this periodic table down here. Um, the F block is supposed to contain 14 elements per row. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So we would consider lanthanum and actinum part of the D block. Um, so it's good to know that sometimes the periodic table like to do that. So they can either go in the D block or the F block. Uh, after the F block orbitals have been filled, that is if you're assigning electrons to F block elements, you will continue filling in D orbitals if there are elements that are beyond the F block. So if I were to do the electron configuration of let's say thallium, I would would be xenon, two, three, four, five, six, six S2. And then instead of continuing on through this D block, we would go down through the F block first. So it's 6S2, 4F14, and then we would go back to our D block. So this would be 5D10, and then finally, what did I say, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6P1. And that would be the electric configuration for thallium. So you want to go F orbital first, then D orbital, and then to P. Hopefully that was clear. Um, the following, I am going to talk about a little bit about the electric configuration for lanthanides and actinides on their own. The following table describes electric configuration for several lanthanides and actinides. Know that the rules for filling electrons for these rows are not parallel. These exceptions are beyond the scope of the class. So I'm going to put up a table that shows the electric configuration for the elements at the bottom. The, at the bottom. They, are, they sometimes follow rules, they sometimes don't follow rules. The reasoning why they do that will not be you will not be tested over that at all. So this is just for exposure's sake. <clears throat> so let's zoom in on this. All right. So we have this is all the lanthanides, and you'll see that we have six S two five D one, and then we don't start with. We start with an F orbital for cerium, but when we get to chrysodymium, we have a situation where instead of putting an electron on the D orbital, it goes to the F orbital. You see it kind of jumps around a lot due to these really weird F orbital rules. So you're not going to be tested on this. You will only have to be exposed to it. So let's do some examples. I had a set of examples. Using the plastic sheet or not using the plastic sheet. So we're going to fill in the blanks for the following, following elements. We're going to start with let's do this configuration. So we're going to do add a name. And then the electron configuration. The electron configurations are going to be noble gas configurations. So if you were given a question on the exam where you were given the electron configuration, let's do neon. Okay, 
periodic table. Three S two. Uh, you would work backwards. So you would go to the periodic table. You would find the noble gas. We're dealing with neon, and we have four at the three S two. So that would be three S two. So the element we're talking about for this electric configuration would be magnesium. Magnesium on its own. Well, let's do let's do iridium two plus. So when presented with a metal cation, what I would do is I would do the electron configuration as if it was iridium on its own, just completely by itself. So iridium, what is iridium? Ooh. Iridium is located We're going to have electrons in the 5D orbital. We're going to have to deal with all these F electrons and then our S electrons. And we're going to have a noble gas configuration of xenon. So let's start with, by writing just the standard configuration without it being oxidized. So it's going to be xenon, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6S2. Six 4F14, remember we want to fill up the F orbitals before we want to the D orbitals. And then 5D, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So this would be the electron configuration for iridium if it was on its own, without being charged. But if I did iridium 2 plus, Remember, I stated earlier that you want to remove electrons from the S shell first. So I would remove these two electrons from the 6S2 orbital, thus giving me a electron configuration of xenon, 4F14, 5D7. This would be the final answer for this cation. Let's see, what else do we have? Some examples all over the place right here. Is this right? So let's do to our periodic table. So we have radon, which would be, this is weird going back and forth like this. Radon uh, right here has 86 protons and 86 electrons. And we're dealing with radon 7s2, 5f14. So we're going to go down to 7s2, so 1, 2. And then we're going to go down this line 14 times, not including actinium because actinium is part of this D, D block. So we're going to start at thorium. So we would have radon, 1, 2 for the, uh, the 7s2. Then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So we have Lorentzian for this. LR. We'll make sure it's consistent when we do the test. 
now I'm going to have to go back to my test and make sure it's consistent. <laughs> Killing me here. Uh, let's do. Now I don't want to use this periodic table because it's like not consistent with what I want. I think we can stop there and move on. Alright. Okay, now that definitely concludes everything that's going to be on the exam. We move on to periodic law. Okay, so this is not going to be on the exam. This is, uh, we're continuing on. So periodic law for chemistry, an important organization principle, the properties, elements, or periodic functions of the atomic number, they recur at regular intervals as protons and electrons are added to each atom. A few periodic trends described in the following sections are metallic character, shielding or screening, I like to call it shielding, the radius of the atom we're looking at, and actually there's a really good periodic table here for that, so we should, yeah, it's right there up against that wall. Not sure. right now, we'll, we'll do it in a little bit. Uh, ionization energy, electron affinity, and electronegativity. So let's, there's going to be a, a whole lot of definitions here that we're going to have to go over. So let's start with, um, we're going to start with metallic character, metals, nonmetals, and ions. So metals make good conductors, are malleable, and have high melting points. The metallic character is highest on the lower left of the periodic table. While the lowest metallic character, nonmetals, is on the upper right hand side. Noble gases have very stable electric configurations because they are filled, they have a filled electron shell. Other elements want to have an electric configuration like a noble gas. As such, metals like to lose electrons by being ionized, and nonmetals like to gain electrons. So if we look at this, our first paragraph says that the highest metal character is going to be highest on the lower left side of the periodic table. So if we look at the periodic table, the highest, if we go in this direction, lower left, the elements on this side of the periodic table have the absolute highest metallic character. And as you move in the opposite direction, you have a higher non-metallic character. And metals, including transition metals and our acolyte earths and alkalites, they like to lose electrons where non-metals like to gain electrons. So we're going to talk about our, an example for a, a metal. I should leave this on so that they can write it down. They can just pause it. Pause the video. So let's do a metal first. So metals like to lose electrons. So if we have something like sodium, sodium would become sodium plus, plus one electron. And if I were to write the electron configurations for uh, everything in this reaction. Well, sodium is going to have an electron configuration of neon, 3s1. Sodium plus has the electron configuration of neon. So now it's acting like a noble gas. It's very, very stable. Plus our lone 3s1 electron that came off. So it loses an electron to become like neon. Now it's really stable. It's happy. So this is free metal. Non-metal. Gain electrons. So which one did I do? I did bromine. Why would I do bromine? Bromine has such a long electron configuration. So bromine, unlike sodium, instead of releasing an electron, likes to gain an electron. So the electron configuration for bromine here, this is the noble gas configuration, is going to be argon, 4s2. 3d10, 4p5. We're going to add one electron, so this is for growing here. And by adding one electron, our configuration becomes krypton. So by adding that electron, it gains well, we configuration. That is seen by looking at the periodic table again. 
So we, have, we were talking about sodium. Sodium releases an electron, becomes like neon. Bromine gains an electron, becomes like proton. Okay. Any questions? Corny. Very corny. Now we're going to talk about atomic radii. Atomic radii is determined by dividing the distance between two nuclei and dividing by two. There are three different types of radii we will learn in this class. We have ionic radii, covalent radii, and metallic radii. The common unit for describing radii is either in angstroms with an A hat or in picometers, where one meter is equal to 10, time, 10 to the 12th picometers, and one meter is also equal to 10 to the 10th angstroms. Angstroms is a measurement that likes to be used in what we like to call crystallography. And um, we're not going to do any crystallography, but it's just a little. So we're going to use the Bohr model to describe this radii. So let's uh, let me get a little piece of paper. So we're going to use the Bohr model to describe this. So you remember that the Bohr model, we start with the nucleus is in the center. Draw the nucleus as this ball right here. And there are two types of electrons for an atom. We have our core electrons. These are electrons that are tightly bound by the nucleus. Core electrons. And then we have the outer shell, which we like to call valence electrons. Valence electrons. These are different color. These are black. So if we were to write the electron configuration for, let's see what example I did. Oh, I did the antidote. Let's write the electron configuration for lanthanum. Lanthanum, the noble gas configuration is going to be, I need to make sure that this is doing right. Yes. Xenon, 6s2, 5d1. The electrons that are located in the configuration for the noble gas are considered our core electrons. So all these electrons that are in the, in the orbitals that would be contained for this for the electron configuration for xenon would be core. So all the electrons here are core electrons. Whatever is left over, that is anything that's after our noble gas, is considered our valence electrons. And valence electrons are the ones that are typically removed, actually always removed, whenever you oxidize, oxidize a atom. So if I were to remove an electron from this lanthanum atom, I am not going to remove from the core first, I'm going to remove from the valence because they're higher energy. So they're easier to pluck off. Atomic size kind of go hand in hand. Valence electrons are blocked from seeing the nucleus by the core electrons. This blocking shields the valence electrons from the nucleus. The core electrons experience the full Z atomic charge of the protons, while valence electrons only experience what we call Z effective. Because of this shielding, it is known that the force of our protons is going to be larger than our Z effective. As shielding increases, the Z effective decreasing, decreases. In general, shielding increases left and down on the periodic table. And I'm going to make a nice little slide of this later in the class that shows all these trends. So as you go left and down on the periodic table, our shielding increases. So elements are more shielded because of their Z effective. So that's going to be this direction right here. And this affects our atomic size. So let me pull up. Let me pull up our previous example. This was our lanthanum. Oh, goodness. So what's happening here is this nucleus is pulling on this core shell, and these core electrons are feeling this full Z. These electrons are shielding the valence shell, and depending on how much it's being shielded, our elements are going to be larger or they're going to be smaller. I 
thought I had a trend. Ah, I do. I do. So I'll we'll get to that in a second. Great. So typically, to uh, recap. If we go down the